I have a profound belief in predestination and fate. I have many examples of that which confirm in my mind that it operates. I, uh, <clears throat> I started at Purdue grad school in 53 and was there three and a half years for master's and doctorate. And the second year I was there, a Mexican kid came in and had the office adjacent to mine, Ignacio Narvaez. Nacho Narvaez was a wheat breeder, Mexican Ministry of Agriculture, associated with the Borlaug program. And Nacho started talking to me about Mexico and his work. And I said to myself, I want to do this. I want to work in international agriculture. I was consumed by this. But every, and I tried everything possible to become affiliated with the Rockefeller Foundation. It was useless. Nothing happened, nothing worked. They just didn't need another plant pathologist at the time. So I finished in 1957. Jobs were scarce. There was no such thing as postdocs in those days, so you went direct from a doctorate to hopefully employment. There was one job available, Madison, Wisconsin, USDA, forage pathologist. I went up there, was offered the job. I said to him, give me a week or two. Went back to Purdue. I lacked one form for my doctoral thesis. So I had to go over to the dean of the School of Agriculture's office, pick up this form. I walked in just after lunch. And it just so happened, I'm talking to the secretary, I'm getting this form. It just so happened that the dean walked by. That was Ernest Young. Dean Young was a consultant to the Rockefeller Foundation. Had been for years. And he knew me because of my frustrated attempts to become, get into the foundation. He says, uh, Peter, what are you going to do? I said, well, Dean, probably go to Wisconsin. He said, didn't you want to work for Rockefeller? I said, yeah. He said, wait a minute. The Dean walked into his office, picked up the phone, called George Harar, left the door open so I could hear. He said, George, I got a kid here. He set some sort of an academic record here at Purdue, and he wants to work for you, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> what's, not, what's George Harar going to do to that? <laughs> so George Harar said, well, let me talk to him. And we had two phone conversations, that day and the subsequent day, which led to employment. But George said something I've never forgotten. He said, would you want to live in the Philippines? And I said, of course. Of course, that night I had to look in my atlas exactly where in the Pacific the Philippines were. And he said, well, we're going to do something there. And it's going to take three or four years to get this organized. This was 1957. But meanwhile, we'll have to find something for you to do. But that's what we're thinking. On the basis of that, I got a job. Terrific. What's the significance of this? Bob Chandler's book goes back 1958, a year and a half later. And that's when all of this started. Ford to Rockefeller, Rockefeller to Ford, the two institutions to the Philippines, going through the process. George Harar had that in his mind a year and a half before. He talked to me specifically, Rice and the Philippines. And you don't see that in Chandler's book. The driving force behind this whole eerie was George Harar, much more than Frosty Hill, I think, who played an immeasurably important role. But it was that Magnificent. He was a giant, this George. So that was 57, early in the spring. I was in Rockefeller, and it was predestined. I would end up sometime in the Philippines. They didn't know what to do with me, so I went to Mexico for a while. Then there was a, an Oja Blanca, which is a virus epidemic in Colombia. And I was told to get myself down there and take a look and identify it. They thought it was Oja Blanca all through tropical Latin America. So I flew down to Colombia with the head of the rice investigations for the USDA. And sure enough, it was Oja Blanca. I knew it because I'd been in Cuba the previous summer. And that led to my immediate transfer to Colombia. And then three and a half, four years later, 
Erie was then in the process of, of uh, starting its activities and I was transferred. That was 61 October. The previous year I had made that long trip through Asia with Sterling and Wortman, that was 60. But from the day I entered Rockefeller, it was understood. The only other thing I'd add that no one seems to remember, I was destined to go to Erie as the plant pathologist, not as the plant breeder. And I was pretty much accepted by everyone. And Sterling and I made that trip. We started in Japan, went through Taiwan, hit the Philippines. George Harar was there, Bob Chandler. We all drove out to Los Manos and saw the site and all of this. And again, that, that came out, I would transfer over as the plant pathologist. Well, Sterling had to stay in Manila that week for some reason. And I proceed, I see, I, I continued. I went to Thailand, Bangkok and met the Thais and whatever they were doing in rice. That's, I met SHO. And after a day or two with SHO, I said to myself, this guy had a vastly more experienced in rice pathology than I. He'd be ideal for the pathologist. Sterling came in to Bangkok uh, to meet me and we would continue. We went on to India and Sri Lanka. And I said, Sterling, I found you a plant pathologist. If you're interested to interview this man, I think he'd be grand. And that's exactly the way it worked out. And I said, if you pick him up as plant pathologist, I'll move over and do the plant breeding. So that's how I became the breeder. <laughs> that area. <laughs> uh, strange coincidences. Well, I spent a little time looking and thinking. And it seemed to me there were four problems that had to be resolved. And if we could solve those problems, there was a pretty high probability of doing something important. And if we couldn't solve those problems, uh, there wouldn't be much progress made. And the first problem was when I got there, it was October 61, someone had put together a collection of popular rice varieties grown throughout Asia. There's some 300 odd varieties in there. And that's all we had. And that was the germplasm of, of uh, Erie. And I spent a lot of time wandering back and forth in the mud, trying to look at these things. And, and Sterling, particularly Sterling Wortman, kept talking to me, we have got to get a germplasm collected here. This, this is a drop. And so, I drafted a letter and we got from Lina Manalo a list of rice workers or experiment stations in some 60 odd countries. And I got T.T. Chang, who was there then, to co-sign this letter and we sent it off. Please send us whatever you can, small seed samples of all the germplasm you would be willing to share with us. These were the days when it was pretty easy to move germplasm, one country to another. There were very few regulations, a quarantine, and all this foolishness that impedes work today. And the response was wonderful. Within months, just boxes and boxes of seed packets started coming in. I guess within two or three years, we had, uh, well, I suppose several thousand accessions. Well, breeding was getting pretty more and more active, and I couldn't manage all this germplasm stuff and the breeding, so I dumped that on, on, Chan, on Titi Chan, and he took it on from there. So that was the first problem. You had to get a lot of germplasm, and that led to this very well-known and I understand very well-maintained seed bank. That year. So that was, that was relatively easy. It just took some time. The second and third problems are going to appear to be awfully minute. But I still consider that if they hadn't been solved, Erie would not have had a breeding program. The first problem was really how do you make crosses in rice? Well, when I left Purdue, picked up by Rockefeller, I had had no experience with rice, so they sent me for four months to the southern United States. Arkansas, Beaumont, Texas, and Louisiana. 
to learn as much as I could before I went on, continued to Mexico. And one day I was in Beaumont, and I said to Hank Beecher, how do you make crosses? He said, well, come on, we'll go to the field and we'll make a cross. Okay. So we get in the pickup truck and he had a couple thermos bottles with him. And he had a little wooden stand. And he took those thermos bottles and this wooden stand out into the mud in the field. The variety he would use as the female parent. And he sets the stand up there and he puts a thermos bottle on top. And the thermos bottle had hot water or hot air, I can't remember which. Uh, something like 44 degrees centigrade. It was the standard method of emasculating. So he very carefully got hold of one comb, bent it over very gently so he wouldn't snap it, inserted it into the thermos bottle, left it for 10 minutes, and it works. It emasculated. Then he could come back the next day and pollinate. Well, I looked at that and I said, that's trash. I mean, this is ridiculous. You do one panicle at a time, then you got to go back to the lab, reheat the water. What's going on here? This is nonsense. Of course, I didn't say that. Anyway, went to Mexico. I didn't have to make crosses in Mexico. I was just trying to get a, a Mexican rice program started. Very quickly, they transferred me to Colombia. Now I was in the business. I had to start breeding for Oja Blanca resistance. How am I going to make crosses? I sure as hell am not going to use a thermos bottle. So I had some good friends in the Rockefeller Foundation at, uh, where we were all located. This is the Colombian, Rockefeller Foundation Colombian Agricultural Program. There were about 20 of us, 18 of us. We all had facilities at Tibaitata, which is on the Sabana of Bogota, 8,600 feet, so there's no rice growing there, obviously. But I had some friends who were small grain breeders, particularly one friend I had known from undergraduate days. And I said, take me out and show me how you make crosses in wheat. He was a wheat breeder. I said, come on. So he got a pair of scissors. He went out to the greenhouse. And he took a spike of wheat. And he started clip, 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 pop, 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 like that. Two minutes, he's emasculated a wheat spike. I, just, I looked at that and said, that's got to work in rice. So, and it did, just clipping. So all the crosses I made in Colombia before going to Erie were made on the basis of clipping. Then you'd sneak in there and sneak out the remnants of the, of the anthers. Then the next day you'd come in and pollinate. Boys, piece of cake. You could do dozens and dozens of panicles in a day. Uh, and it, uh, it had, Lots of advantages and no defects, as far as I could figure. Okay, so I got to Erie. Well, I'm gonna clip. I'm not gonna fool around with thermos bottles. The first trainees, I think the euphemism today is uh, scholars or something, but the trainees, were three Thai kids. Came to Erie, into our department. I grabbed two of them. And Chang got one. And one of them was named Mani. And I got hold of this kid and I gave him 20 or 25 varieties and a list of crosses to make. And we did it in the, uh, or he did it in the screen house. And I said, make all possible combinations. So this is, you know, several hundred crosses. I said, clip and keep a careful record. How many panicles? How many florets have you clipped? How many have you pollinated? What's the seed set? That kind of stuff. Boy, that kid worked his tail off. He had 50,000 emasculation, or some ridiculous number. And the seed set was perfect, excellent. Um, all kinds of weird combinations, indicas, japonicas, tall, shorts, whatever. And no problems. So I wrote it up as a little article with money, and we sent it into crop science. That method, clipping method, with, with certain improvements over years, I think is still the standard uh, worldwide for emasculating rice. And it replaced very quickly that business of treating with hot air or hot water. <laughs> That's small, but absolutely critical. So that, that, in retrospect, was easy. The third problem that I saw was related to grain dormancy. 
if you're going to have a program in the tropics and you're going to plant twice a year, two crops a year, two generations, you've got to have a way of breaking dormancy. Because if you don't, what you harvest today and replant to get the two crops in, the only stuff that's going to germinate is the non-dormant. The dormants will just stay in there. They won't germinate. And that's exactly what you do not want, or non dormants You had to have dormancy in tropical rice. Well, now how are you going to break dormancy? No one I talked to could tell me exactly how you do this. So I went up to the College of Agriculture and talked to Pedro Oscuro, who was then head of the plant breeding department of the college. I said, Pedro, how do you break dormancy? He said, oh, yeah, no sweat. And he took, <laughs> he took me out. He showed me a 55-gallon oil drum. And he had cut out a circular hole at the bottom of this drum into which he could put kindling. And he'd build a fire in this drum. And then halfway up this drum, he had a screen mesh that he inserted, and you put your sacks of rice on top of that. I looked at that. He said, this breaks dormancy. He said, this is smoke. It's, it's the smoke that's, that's filtering up through this drum and it's breaking dormancy. Well, this got pretty weird because he insisted that it had to be one specific species of tree from which they got the kindling. I said, come on. This doesn't sound right to me. Of course, I'm not saying anything of what I'm thinking. Anyway, I went back down to your and I talked to Joe De Jesus, who was one of our first research assistants. I said, Joe, go round up some incubators. And he did. And we, uh, we got a bunch of recently harvested rice varieties. I don't remember how many. And we stuck them in those incubators for, at different temperatures. I kind of figured, this is not smoke. There's got to be temperature. You know, for several, 50 degrees, 45 degrees, 50, whatever the range was, different varying lengths of time. Two days, five days, a week, whatever. Boom! Broke dormancy. Priceless. Broke dormancy at practically everything. 50 degrees, a week or so, that was it. You're ready to plant. Problem solved. I wrote that up with Joe, and again, we published that. I think it was Crop Science. You say, well, you look back and say, well, pretty small sort of thing. It wouldn't have been two crops a year without some little method to break dorms. So I was very, I'm very proud of those two contributions. You never hear about this. Crossing, how do you cross? How do you break dorms? The fourth problem was, was immense. It, it was complicated. Chandler's going around preaching, increase yields. Okay, that's easy to say. How do you do it? That's another subject. There was a lot of debate, even within Erie. The problems of these miserable yields in Asia were, were largely agronomic. And all you had to do was teach the farmers to plant a little better, and maybe fertilize a little better, get the weeds out a little, or something like that, and the yields would go up. And it didn't make sense to me on the basis of a lot of experience out of FAO, but that wasn't my job. My job was breeding varieties. So I had to assume the problem was varieties. Well, now what are you going to breed for? What are the objectives here? Chandler says high yield. Okay. How do you get high yield? Man, that was a problem. Fortunately, a great friend of mine, came to Erie in early 1962, Akira Tanaka. Tanaka was the head of the crop physiology, plant physiology department at Erie. He was by far the most experienced rice scientist at Erie in those days. He was good. And his job at Erie, his, his love was mineral nutrition, particularly deficiencies. But his job was really to take the tropical rice part, plant apart, analyze it. The stems, the leaves, the architecture, relate this to solar radiation, to temperature or whatever. What's going on with the plant? The population of 
of rice plants in a field, why are they not yielding very well? He had to try and understand that, so he took it apart. And he, his work was classic. And I spent a lot of time just talking to Tanaka. And I'd ask him, okay, Tanaka, tell me, what should the leaf look like on an ideal plant that's going to yield more? And we'd talk about that. And then I'd say, well, tell me about the stems, the combs. What should they look like? On and on. You know, what, we're trying to develop a mental image in our minds of what an ideal plant would look like. There was a little bit of published information on plant type, uh, particularly from Japan. Not much, but just enough to kind of suggest to me and to Tanaka that if we're going to make any progress, we had to change dramatically the plant type. So we had lots and lots of conversations. We're each feeling our way, and one feeds the other. One says something, the other listens, and says, wow, yeah. Maybe, therefore, if we do that, and the other guy says, yeah, and back and forth. Uh, I immensely appreciated those conversations. The net result of all that was an image formed in my mind, and I checked it out with Tanaka. I said, this is what I now think. The first seminar I gave at Erie was on an ideal, what an ideal plant type had to look like if we were going to get higher yields. I wrote that up, and I sent it to crop science. And there, was, there were no data, it was just philosophy. For some reason, crop science published it. Years later, years later, I reread that paper, long after I already came out. And it just seemed to me that IRA looks very much like what we were theorizing. But at this point, it's theory. We think this is what it has to Now, how are you going to do that? How are you going to change a plant from here down to here with all the attendant changes in leaves and color and angles and all this other stuff? Well, the rest of the story is just plain sheer, pure luck. And that goes back to that first set of crosses, that uh, set of varieties that I think Sterling had put together, 300 some odd varieties. In there were those three famous Taiwan, short statured varieties. And they looked terrible under Philippine conditions. They were riddled with bacterial leaf blight. They were shaded by tall things. They were sterile and they were misery, but they were short. So oh, I don't know what else. All right, we'll cross them. That first year, I, with Rudy Aquino, another of our esteemed research assistants, gave him a list, 38 crosses, combinations. About half of them, I think, involved one or the other of the three Taiwan short statured materials. And at this point, I diverge from the commonly accepted story of how IR8 was developed. Uh, and Chandler wrote, and he had to, that these materials were called to our attention, or really my attention as the reader, by T.T. Chang. No way, never. Nobody knew what those three varieties had, no one. None of the Taiwanese, none of the Japanese who had worked in Taiwan, no one had an idea about the inheritance of their being short. SHO didn't know. He never talked to me about it. And he had come out of China before going to Taiwan. So it was blind crossing. Some tall things which are horrible, lodging, and these short kind of miserable, disease susceptible, but short. And we grew out the F1s, 38 combinations, which is ridiculous by the standards of today. 38 crosses in a year is a, is a drop. I mean, even in our little program in Colombia, we make a thousand crosses a year now. So what are the odds of hitting anything with 38? And I've always figured that a pretty fair plant breeder rice breeder has to make about a thousand crosses for every variety he releases, at least. So 38, absurd, but that's what we had. So we grew out the F1s, they were terrible. They were worse than the parents themselves. 
you got heterosis, they're growing in a greenhouse, we probably put some nitrogen on them. They were gigantic. Yeah, they must have been six, seven feet tall. Well, what are you gonna do? That's all you got. So you harvest seed from each of these crosses, single crosses, A times B, tall times short. Put them out in the field. Populations F2, 38 populations. And for not having anything else, we had large populations. I can't remember, 4,000, 6,000 plants each, each single cross, something like that. Well, I had these two Thai trainees. And it was my practice, essentially every day, to grit, get hold of these kids and let's go out the field. We'll walk around, just look at this stuff. And we'd go out after transplanting. First couple of weeks, yeah, it's rice, the little seedlings are recovering, and you couldn't see anything. Well, I don't know, maybe a month after transplanting, we, one day we looked out there. It was an epiphany. I've never had an experience like that in my life before or since. We looked at the first crosses, tall this, crossed with tall that, terrible. It was a, it was a jungle. The F2 is always a jungle, but this was a bad one. Nothing, obviously. We came on the first of the crosses that involved one of the three Taiwan short things. And you look down there, and say, Jesus, something has happened. There were bigs, plants, and there were short plants. And there were no intermediate plants. They were huge, but they were short. Wow. And the short ones, leaves like this, erect, darker green, sturdy stems, high tillering. So I got the kids and we took off our sneakers and we plowed into the mud and I said, okay, kid one, you count two rows. Kid two, you count two, I'll count two rows. How many talls, how many shorts? Came back, added them up, three to one. Essentially three to one. Obviously, single gene recessive for shortness. It may sound something like arrogance but I contend that I knew at that moment the significance of this. So I did four things, three or four things immediately after we got out of the field. I got Tanaka. I said, Tanaka, I got something to show you. Took him out. He looked at that, hi, hi. <laughs> yeah, that's, Tanaka either said hi or just shake his head. Shake his head was no. I said, Jeez. He saw it. Then I went in and got Sterling Wharton. I said, can you get Bob Chandler? I grabbed those two guys, took them out. This is the same day. Said, Look at that. I explained a little more to them than I had to to Tanaka. They got it immediately. And then I went and sent a telegram to Beechel. I said, I think I found a simply inherited dwarfing gene that works. Because the panicle, it turned out the panicle was not dwarfed. There had been lots and lots of dwarfing genes, but they were miserable because the panicle was dwarfed. You know, what are you going to do? So, obviously, we concentrated. I had those two ties and my research assistants. Came time flowering, maturity. We had to harvest plants. We had gone in with sickles. We cut out all the tall plants so that the little short things wouldn't be terribly shaded. Just harvested seed individual plants of the short ones and on the eighth cross ir8 which meant the eighth cross made uh i don't know for some reason we picked out three or four hundred plants i'm sure that's a big f2 selection rate which would give you three or four hundred f3 rows okay and the same for the other cross and then this is now taking us into uh, 1963 I was leaving on sabbatical, I, for various reasons. I just had to get a year away from Erie. And to replace me, I had suggested to Chandler they bring Beecho in, which is another story. When Erie started in the plant, what was it called? Plant breeding department, varietal improvement department. There were three senior scientist positions allocated. A breeder, myself, geneticist, Chang, 
and a cytogeneticist. Well, I had a course in cytogenetics at Purdue, and I didn't understand a thing from one semester to the next. And even worse, I couldn't see how that related to plant breeding. It was a bandwagon in those days. Everybody had to know something about cytogenetics. And after seeing what we had, I went to Chen and said, I'll trade you. Let's dump the cytogenetics. Let's have a second breeder. And if you're willing to do that, I'd recommend Beechel. And hence, Beechel came in as I was leaving for a year sabbatical. By then, these F3 lines had been planted out there, and they looked wonderful. They just conf confirmed the F2. These rows were pure dwarfs. They weren't segregating, as you would expect, on a recessive gene, and they were magnificent. Oh, just extraordinary compared to the tall, traditional, leafy, lodging things. So I figured it was in the bag, and it was. And then Beechel went in and, and selected F3 rows, plants from F3 rows, and that took him in. By then I was back, F4 took us into the F4, and from there it was just pick out the best one and multiply seed like crazy. And that's really the true story of IR8. A lot of people afterwards tried to assume parts of the credit for what was done. But the story I just gave you is the true story. Far more impressive in my mind was that first day when we saw that segregation in the F2. As I said, it was an epiphany. No one could have expected that. It was unexpected. It was almost serendipity. And this is where the wheat and the rice stories are totally different. The green revolution based on those two, two grain crops. Rice, I contend, no one knew that there were a single recessive gene in these Taiwan materials. In the wheat, it was very different. Japanese breeders had been producing dwarf wheats for years. Dwarf wheats were produced in America, the United States, before Borla got hold, and got hold of them and produced semi-dwarf wheats for the more tropical. They knew what they had. They knew that they had dwarfing genes. Good varieties had been produced. Rice. No one knew, is my interpretation. Now, years later, I met Ronnie Kaufman, and he said that he had been in China, and the Chinese told him that they knew all about this prior, prior to IR8. Well, maybe so. I just don't believe it. Because SHO didn't know anything, and he had been working in rice in, in China. The Chinese didn't know. In Taiwan, T.T. Chang didn't know. And I suspect if the Chinese indeed had known that they had this and had done that, they would have made a lot of noise about it. I think it's a combination of jingoism and revisionist history. But it really doesn't matter, does it? It was done. Who gives a damn where? It just happened. It was done at Erie. And of course, that led to the Green Revolution, and we all know the rest of the story, total, total luck. The only programmed part of it was we had this prior concept talking with Tanaka, what it, ideally, what would it look like? But that's a far cry from producing it. And the producing it was just good fortune. That was the best day I had at Erie. Sure, tremendous quality above all. Um, milling quality. Grain appearance, shabby. Grain shape was terrible. Uh, in the Asian environment, it came up with, uh, this was after my day, uh, disease problems. I'm sure insect problems. We didn't have that much in Latin America with that variety. The problems we had were more in the milling side of the industry. But yeah, it had problems. But that was the first step. And in Latin America, we start pumping out varieties very quickly to replace IRE, which had made a huge impact in a great portion of Latin America. And it lasted, uh, I don't know, four or five years. And then it was replaced quickly by better quality things. 
sure, it was terrible in that sense, but it had this tremendous capacity to produce. And that's, that's what sold it. I'm sure many of your interviewees will comment extensively about Chandler, his mannerisms, the way he conducted his business. I'll only add on that subject that he was well named, Robert Flint Chandler. He was flinty. He was a stereotypical New England Yankee. He was laconic, very direct, hyper enthusiastic, maintained a, a profound barrier between himself and the staff. He was nobody's pal. But with all of that, he's by far the best director of an institution I've seen in 50 years. Uh, my comments, I think, would be in a little bit different direction. I think Bob left two legacies to Erie. The first was he defined precisely what the objective of the institution was. And for Bob, it was very clear. It was single, higher yield, better quality. And we look back at that, and it just seems obvious to us now. But 50 years ago, in Asia, Latin America, researchers didn't talk in those terms. They talked, if you were going to talk to them, they talked to you in specifics about the little whatever they were doing. But you never heard, get production up and improve the quality. I think Bob Chandler got that from George Harar, who was then Director for Agriculture, Rockefeller Foundation. Because in all of the memos that passed between Ford and Rockefeller, leading to uh, consultations with Philippine authorities, leading to the articles of uh, the establishment of Erie, that is the single objective for the Institute that is repeated in every document. Higher yield, better quality. And Chandler, on every opportunity that I can recall, staff meetings, seminars, individual conversations, every visitor who came to Erie on his travels to other countries, he hammered that theme. And he wouldn't let it go. He just beat it to death. And I think it was important because all of us in the first group understood from the very beginning what our job was. And it somehow brought all the disparate disciplines together, focused in on that one single objective. I think it was extremely important. I'll give you a, a, uh, an idea of what I'm leading to, because that, by hammering on that, it became absorbed into the minds of everybody. I think he converted everybody. I had a long trip in Asia before getting to Erie, 1960. And I traveled with Sterling Wortman, something like five weeks. Sterling Wortman was then the assistant director for Erie. He had just moved to the Philippines, living in Manila. And the purpose of that trip was uh, uh, for me to see something about rice in Asia, to learn who the players were in the various institutions and, and the peoples involved with rice and if possible, to find potential new staff for this forthcoming Erie. And parenthetically, we found three. The very brilliant uh, Panap Ruma, the excellent pathologist uh, SHO, and T.T. Chang. But anyway, in the course of these travels, Sterling and I had a lot of time together, and I asked him one day, Sterling, when you were a pineapple breeder in Hawaii, what was your objective? He said, I had one. He says it was to produce a round pineapple. I looked at him. It was sort of a sarcastic look, I'm sure. He got a little defensive and he said, I had to do that because the industry demanded that the pineapple be perfectly cylindrical so it fit in a tin can. 
All right, I let it go. Six years later, I knew I was, I had to leave Erie. Uh, when I got there, I identified four problems that had to be solved, and I figured by 1966, those problems had been essentially resolved. So I went to the United States, interviewed at universities, went up to Cornell, was offered a, a plum job, full professor with a much higher salary. I said to him, I'd get back to him in 10 days. On the way back to Manila, I stopped in New York. There's a courtesy call, nothing more. New York office of Rockefeller. Sterling was there. Sterling had left Erie, returned to Hawaii, was pulled out of Hawaii very quickly into New York by George Harar. George Harar was then either vice president or president of the foundation. Sterling came in as director for agriculture. And I, I went into Sterling's office and he asked me what I was going to do. I said, well, Sterling, I said, maybe I'll go to Cornell. He said, well, wait a minute. Suppose you go back to Columbia. I perked up. He said, yeah, you can start an inter-American rice program. This was five years before SEAT was created. So I'd be all alone. Then he said something spectacular. He said, I will evaluate you on your ability to increase national yields of rice. I looked at that man, I could have kissed him. Sterling Wortman progressed from breeding round pineapples to emphasis on production and yield averages. Where did he get that? It was drilled into him by Bob Chandler. So that, that was one legacy I think was crucial. The second that sticks in my mind is Bob expected everyone at Erie, whether it be a laborer, a cook, research assistant, secretary, senior staff, he expected the very best excellence from each and every member of city. If everyone were to do his job well, then there were better probabilities of being successful. He could not abide sloppiness. It would drive him hysterical if he saw a piece of paper, scrap paper floating around the area someplace. He wanted the job done well to the best of your capabilities. And again, I think that that infused throughout the entire institution and brought us all together. Our standards were set high from the very beginning. I'll give you another example of what I'm talking about. Again, it goes back to Sterling Wortman. On this trip that we were taking, I had met Bob Chandler before, but I asked Sterling, How's it, what's it like working with Bob Chandler? And uh, he told me, yeah, but he said, there's one thing that's driving me crazy. Sterling was then assistant director of Erie, I think it was, in Manila. He said, I cannot write a letter on Erie letterhead and send it to anybody without Bob Chandler reviewing the letter before it goes mailed. Wow. And he's, he's grumbling. Sterling's grumbling about this. And he said, I'd get my letters back. They'd be corrected for syntax, for spelling, for grammar. <laughs> and he was frustrated. He didn't, he didn't like that. What's the point? Sterling in those days was not a good writer. I adore Sterling Wortman, but he was not a good writer. Within five or six years, he became a superb writer. He put out a very good book, and he wrote it himself. Very, now, how did he learn that? Chandler. Chandler trained him. Chandler could not abide having a letter leave Erie that had a grammatical error in it, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I think others will comment in different ways, but for me, those were the two immense legacies that he, he left, installed and left, I hope he left at Erie, certainly the ones that impressed me. How many were there of us? I think maybe 15, 16 researchers. This would be 1961 and through 62. Uh, this is discounting uh, Rebecca Pasquale, senior staff and excellent. 
uh, Lena Manalo, senior staff, excellent, but they're more into service, now, excluding the administration, Joe Drulone and Sterling and Bob. What was left of CORE, maybe 15, spread out over several disciplines. I particularly enjoyed talking with three of them, I think it was, basically, four, actually. SHO, who was a, a, a real source, a valuable source of wisdom, and a lot of experience, excellent eyes. And I talked to him about pathology. This is not breeding exactly, but I was trying to learn as much as I could, how he sort of related to what I was trying to do. And we got along very well and conversed at length. Um, Felix was another, Panapruma. His subject was this esoteric, complicated business of the chemistry of flooded soils. What's that got to do with plant breeding? I don't know, nothing. But he was smart, and I just like to talk to Felix. And I'm not, I cannot put my finger on much that accrued from those conversations into breeding, but I just know I'd like to talk to him, so I, I have appreciated him very much. Another I thought very highly of, and no one ever hears about him, is uh, Lloyd Johnson, who was the ag engineer and the developer of the experiment station. Real practical guy, knew a lot about machinery. And it was just obvious that we had to be thinking about machinery if we were going to do breeding. Because every time you make a change in a plant, you're going to make some sort of a change in the way the farmer grows it. I had very high respect for those. Let me go back to Tanaka. Uh, if I were to go to Erie tomorrow and give a seminar, and I'd ask the audience, who can tell me about Akira Tanaka? There would be very few who could even identify him. And what was his contribution? Well, he did this really excellent work on the physiology of populations. But I don't remember him for that. I remember him for being a good friend and a conversationalist, a partner, just talking back and forth because he had all this experience. And his contribution to IR8 is equivalent, in my mind, to that of the breeder. If we do this and this and this, something good might happen. Without Tanaka, I think we would have struggled accepting this whole situation with luck. I think Erie would have struggled a little longer. Tanaka's not remembered for this. I remember Tanaka. He was a giant. I'll tell you one, it's related to the visit, I think it was about October 1966 of Lyndon Baines Johnson, then President of the United States to Erie. But I have to give you the setting first of this, this story. Somewhere, maybe it was the year previous, Beechel had done a very good job of cleaning up a line that was ultimately selected to result in IR8, cleaning it up in the sense of producing fairly uniform seed. I can't remember how much he had or we had, but that seed was given to Federico Ramos, who was then the station superintendent, I think it was called, for Erie. And Federico planted out a big area, and I think he harvested about 50 tons of what became IR8. The bulk of that went to I'm not sure what it was called. It was part of the Philippine Agriculture Corn and Rice Bureau or something like that, and I presume for distribution. But I insisted that Federico give me five tons. And Orly Santos, who was the assistant to Federico. He just passed away recently. Orly passed away. Orly and I packaged that five tons, we broke it down into 2,500 two kilo bags. And I said to Orly or Federico or both of them, I don't, don't recall, we want to give this seed out to any farmer who would come by Erie and pick it up. No questions asked, no, no cost involved. And somehow they got the word out. And it was extraordinary. Within a week or 10 days, 
we exhausted 2,500 bags at two kilos each. And I kept a record for a while there of the names of these guys, these farmers, and the, what province they came from. I don't know if that list still exists, but they came from all over the field. And how they heard about this, I'll never know. But they came in horses, they came in jeepneys, they walked in, they bicycled in, they got there. And we gave me each a bag and told. Well, in retrospect, that was a superb mechanism for disseminating, extending, getting the spread around the Philippines. It worked. Somewhere in late 55, 65 or 66, perhaps, the press got hold of the story of IR8, and it became quite a thing. Green Revolution. And for a while there, Erie was inundated with visitors. Prime ministers, kings, queens. High potentates of all sorts and descriptions. And Chandler would announce, so-and-so is coming next week, shape it up. And, you know, white shirt and tie. And then we got the announcement, President Johnson was coming. 